<laughs> I know, right? They're all dumbasses. <sighs> Talking here with Woody the Woodpecker about how the dumbasses. Why? <laughs> because it's freaking. Wait a minute, I'm out of uniform. There's a military expression for you, huh? Being out of uniform. All right. Ha <laughs> ha You're all dumbasses because it's 28 degrees and there's snow and ice everywhere and you're outside when you could be inside when it's warm and... <sighs> Wait a minute. That's me. Oh! Yeah, I remember the dumbasses I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, there goes the plow truck. <sighs> So, okay, yeah, it really is 28. There's snow and ice everywhere, as you can see behind me, and you hear the plow trucks. But uh, I just did a five-mile run. I know it's a little uncomfortable doing it in weather like this, but uh, doing it today is going to benefit me as long as I'm consistent in the future for the long term because that's how I've kind of learned to think. Not so much about today, uh, but about the longer term, the big picture. And that's what brings us to today's topic. It has to do with willing to be wrong today and not be, you know, the smartest guy in the room, Mr. Know-it-all today, so that you don't end up, because largely these folks do end up being long-term dumbasses. And I'm going to explain why. Listen, it's really as simple as when you think you know it all, you don't. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. What have you? Now, you remember to get my six... For we never know what may or may not show up in the background behind me as we do these videos. I just finished running, so I'm taking you along for my cool down. I always walk around 10, 15 minutes or so to cool down. Um, so, Dearly and I were talking this morning, and this brought up this issue of these one-day know-it-alls becoming long-term dumbasses. Uh, I've seen it so much. Many of you out there have seen it as well. Uh, and speaking of the weather... You know, Dearly was watching a video on her channel, Life with Dearly. Go subscribe and watch your videos if you haven't yet. It will really increase the quality of your life if you do. Just to see somebody with such an infectious smile, infectious laugh, uh, uh, world-renowned beauty. Um, just go watch my wife. I know she cheers me up constantly. She keeps me happy. Uh, but she was watching a video of our son, Daniel, playing in basketball in the rain last year and she was getting kind of down she getting cabin fever you know because she's from the south pacific the tropical islands of the philippines where it's summer every day all year round she doesn't do so great in the winter so i said when was the date of that video the video she's watching of our kid playing basketball in the rain without a shirt on just in his shorts she said march of this past year i said well think about it honey it's february now as of this recording it's february 1 march is next month so we're less than a month away from getting out of this crappy weather. <clears throat> My son fell. I was gonna say, warning. Bigfoot area, potentially, stay on marked trails. <laughs> what was that? Hey. There were just birds singing, screaming. Woody Woodpecker was back here laughing at all the one-day know-it-alls who end up being long-term dumbasses. And now I'm not hearing anything. This is a point when most people would turn around and go back, especially after running into a sign like that. But pff, whatever. By the way, Betty Brooks, thanks for sending me that sign last year in the mail. And is it Caleb, your grandchild? And I'm glad to hear your son, who is also a runner, is enjoying his slow down Karen shirts we have. These things I invented this winter. They're blaze orange like this. But they say slow down Karen. I've got mine in there. I wear it if I'm running uh, during the time when the people are commuting to work and back. It helps uh, avoid getting run over or ran out of the road as I mean, I'm hoping it does. So Betty Brooks got some for her son. And her grandson. You can get some in our Etsy store. The link's in the description box below. There's only a few left. but uh, And they're all size large and men's. I'm going to have to go like this. I thought I saw something. 
So hang in there. If the weather's got you down, uh, you do need to get out. Your vitamin D intake's low. Get some sun and uh, do the things you enjoy that you can do. Don't just sit around focusing on how miserable winter can be. I've done that, man. I've spent, spent plenty of winters doing that. That's counterproductive. It doesn't do any good. All right, so we were talking, and uh, we're in the process of, of looking at some new products. A couple of new products over the last couple of days. Um, certain classes. I'm going to give you an example because I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, you know, Dearly recently passed her, her driving test and she's now being taught how to drive. And I've been telling her for years, a lot of folks, but why doesn't your wife drive? You misogynist. You went and got some beautiful uh, woman from the Philippines and brought her here and don't let her drive and blah, you pig. No, <laughs> I have been begging her to drive from day one, but she's never done it. And uh, so she was just uncomfortable doing it. But one day, last year, she's like, I think I'm ready to drive. So good. She studied for the test. She passed the test. She's doing it. And I've been telling her the whole time, honey, when you want to start driving, you get your license, I will buy you a brand new Mercedes Benz. I've been telling her that. Of course, she wanted the Toyota Ford Runner or Ford Runner and whatever. I finally, yesterday we were looking at Benzes, okay? And she said, well, what's the difference between this class, this, that, this class and that class? I said, don't pay any attention to that. That's for marketing purposes. Uh, and I explained about how there's different for different people in different price ranges. So just pick the one you like. Don't get caught up in that stuff. And then today, she was looking at uh, something else. Treadmills. Because I got her one for Christmas. Get this. Got her one for Christmas. And they sent it. Then the guy came a week later to put it together. And the company had sent the wrong size monitor. The, the guy got it 90% of the way put together. And then when he went to put the monitor on, which has the control panel and everything on it, it was for a different model. So get this. He and I and the sales uh, assistants at the company contacted the manufacturer and said, look, this is what is wrong. This is the only thing we need. Can we send this monitor back to you and you send us this other monitor? And they said no. They said we had to cancel the order. They would refund my money. And then they'll, they'll come pick up their entire machine. And then once that entire machine is picked up, uh, then we can buy another one and they'll send another one back. So basically what they were saying is we don't believe you people. We don't believe the, the, the customer that bought it. We don't believe the technician that went out to assemble it. And we don't believe, we don't believe the sales assistants at Amazon. Uh, so it was, uh, Nordic track, by the way. And so <clears throat> I said, okay, let's cancel the sale. Sale canceled. Okay. Give me my money back. Okay. Boom. There's your money back. You'll see it within three business days back in your bank. I said, okay, now let's schedule the appointment to have them come pick up this one. They're like, okay, they scheduled the appointment to come pick it up. Coming today, actually. And, uh, they said, okay, now are you ready to place your order for your new one? And I said, no, absolutely not. I said, because you don't follow through with your service, I'm going to buy another, uh, another treadmill, but I'm going to buy it from one of your competitors. Have a good day. I got up the phone. They do come today and take this one out of here and free up that space. We're going to buy a new one from a different company. So anyway, um, we don't reward bad behavior. Um, so she's looking at treadmills and it's all these different classes. And she's like, well, what's this? Class? And I said, honey, it's like the Mercedes Benzes. I told you yesterday. It's selling points. And so I gave her an example. And this is the example I want to, I'm going to give you the example I gave her. And this is when I had this aha moment. Uh, because so much more has made sense to me. Listen, somebody commented in a video I made the other day, uh, the one, the, very few of you watched, and I get it, it's a 43 minute long video, and it, and it did come across as political, and I don't do politics on here, because I'm non, I, I like to say I'm non-political, but I'm really more like a, somebody that kind of has different views all over the spectrum, and so I just don't fall into one category. You can't pigeonhole me as much as you want to try, uh, despite that's how we're brought up in this country, to pigeonhole everybody, give everybody and everything a title and pigeonhole them this way. So, you know, if you see somebody, uh, this is one of the reasons I don't put bumper stickers on my cars, okay? You put a bumper sticker on your car that says so-and-so for president, everybody's going to assume so much about you that is farthest from the truth of who you are based upon one thing, one aspect of your life because we're trained to pigeonhole. All right, so a term was used on that video in the comment section I'd never heard. I Googled it and I'm like, how do I not know about this? So I spent the last few days studying it to determine where it comes from. Uh, and I wanna share it with you because this will let, I guess, unfortunately, some of you out there, I know there's at least one person watching this. I banned them like 30 different times with 30 different fake profiles. I know who they are. And this person suffers from this condition more than anyone I've ever met in my life. Uh, the condition is called 
Kruger Dunning. Kruger Dunning's condition. Who's ever heard of it? I know, right? It's easy to remember because you think of Freddy Krueger and then um, Dunning. I used to fly fish. There's several different, like a gray Dunning, a brown Dunning. So it was pretty easy. Kruger Dunning. <sighs> Kruger Dunning is a condition experienced by a certain type of person as far as IQ goes uh, that causes them to do a certain thing that can cause... Uh, well, it will ruin their lives. It really pre it prevents them from taking advantage of a crap ton of opportunities. Uh, and it can be damaging to those who spend too much time with them because they will be begin to see things in life that are really not as they are. Here's what I'm talking about. The folks that suffer Kruger Dunning have very low IQs. Now, they're not low enough, and I'm not saying any of this to be derogatory. I'm saying this to explain to you this condition. You can Google it, and you will find that everything I'm telling you is correct. They have low IQs, but not low enough to be considered, you know, a part of the spectrum that might, let's say they're still school-age individuals. They wouldn't be put in any sort of uh, assisted classes. Well, and they don't even do that now. They have this thing called uh, integration. Where, you know, when I was a student, I graduated high school in 1992. So everybody, for me and before that, and for just a few years after, they had what was called special education classes. Well, there, of course, towards the late 90s, they, they worked more towards inclusion. That's the word, and integration. They took these students out of these lab classes and kind of put them where they could fit in with the... Uh, because that, and that was, I think that was good because it got rid of a lot of the stigmas associated with having been in those other classes, okay? Uh Social stigmas, which really can, it will affect you for life. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on what it's like to have grown up in poverty and then escape poverty and then uh, wonder why you have some uncomfortable feelings fitting in once, you know, with the uh, upper socioeconomic classes and a lot of stuff, but whatever. My mind, if you could be in here for a day, it would wear you out. And let me tell you, it has nothing to do with running five to eight miles every day or three if we're taking an easy day. You would be worn out if you're up here for a day. All right, so anyway, Kruger Dunning. Um, they learn to become chameleons kind of early. And I would say my, my, I would estimate it's happened even more so with this concept of inclusion because no one wants to look like they don't know. Um, this has always been, uh, one of my biggest frustrations with intellectual, highly educated intellectual elitist types. They, they seem to simply not know how to say, I don't know. To the point to where there's one college professor I had in college. I, 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 this memory sticks out, and this was going back a quarter of a century because it was so profound. He was introducing himself the first day of class when he's going over the syllabus, and he said, there's one thing about me you'll hear from me that you'll probably never hear from any other college professor during the course of your college career. And he was right, and it took me six years to get a bachelor's because I had to work my way through college, 40 hours a week working, plus going to school, all this stuff, um, plus taking out loans. Uh, but he said, if you ask me a question and I, I seriously don't know the answer, I will say, I don't know. And you could hear, <gasps> and the whole auditorium just went silent. It's like, here is somebody with multiple PhDs who actually wrote the text, the, the required text for the course. He was willing to admit he just didn't know. <sighs> Man. So uh, anyway, that guy and I would later learn there's this thing called humility. That guy was basically, he was much more humble than most folks in his industry, in his field. So anyway, Kruger Dunning, uh, it, it's when people who have lower IQs and who understand a little bit about a subject think they understand way more than they do. And the scary part comes in when they're able to convince people that they know way more than they do, especially if they're convincing. And a lot of times these folks become convincing because they have to. It's like, okay, I got to convince these people. I know what I'm talking about, whether I do or not, or they're going to think I'm stupid. And they kind of have, you know, some insecurities associated with may maybe not being quite up to speed in some areas as their peers. <clears throat> so, they can become very convincing people they usually are. Uh, they, are they, they are so convincing that even though they're talking out of their, their butt uh, to whatever the topic is, you'll be convinced that they're right. And uh, I, I've seen it with, with – there's an individual that has Kruger Dunning that, that I know that I've associated with in the past, and it's like, wow, that's why everything he said wasn't even accurate and whatever. Um, 
but here's how it came up. Uh, I, I use this example when I explain to Dearly about the different classes. When I was a stockbroker for eight years, you, you know about mutual funds. Um, there was, okay, I got paid commissions to sell mutual funds. There were three classes of funds. Now get this. Uh, this was late 90s, early 2000s. This is when online trading started to become a thing. Um, no load mutual funds were a big thing. Fidelity, Vanguard. You, if you, if you really knew what you're doing, you didn't need a broker. I don't use a broker. Um, I use Ameritrade. I do my own thing, but I used to be a Series 7 securities licensed dealer and I worked in the industry for nearly a decade and I've stayed current, not necessarily with how particular stocks are doing, but with, uh, economics, this kind of stuff. Uh, <sighs> other than the stocks that I follow or whatever, have an interest in. Okay, there were A-share mutual funds. Um, these, there were A-share, B-share, and C-share. A-shares were best for the client. B-shares were best for the broker who didn't have the confidence to sell the eight shares or the A-shares. And C-shares were best for the broker. But they were the most easily sold to the one-day know-it-all types. And it would end up over time long term making them uh, proving they're the dumbasses long term that they are here's what i mean you buy an a share mutual fund you got less than fifty thousand dollars you're not hitting any break points you're going to pay like 5.75 percent up front in a commission to the broker to the brokerage house this is how it worked back then but if you ever want to sell out of your funds after that there's no commission and then there's the lowest annual maintenance fee that the money managers charge of any other share class B share mutual funds, there's no commission going into the fund when you purchase the shares, but if you sell within the first five years, you get a graduated commission. They, you might think of it as a penalty to sell out. In that first year, it's 5%, then four, then three, then two, then one. And then after five years, you can pull out with no commission. They have higher annual management fees in the A shares, but nowhere near as high as the C shares. Now, these are the one, the only people that I ever sold C-share mutual funds to were surprise, surprise college professors because these folks would come in and they'd let you know how much they knew about the work you did, even though they've never done the work you did um, because of whatever journal they follow or maybe they even teach economics, but still it's, it's different. Listen, those who do teach and those who, or those who can do, those who can't teach and those who can't teach, teach college. We all know it. Okay. But I acted like I didn't know it. I was like, oh, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am. And uh, but they come in, they're not paying commissions. I'm not paying a commission. I'm too smart for that. And it had nothing to do with, you know, being thrifty or, you know, making sure they're getting what they're, it's about their intelligence. It's always about their intelligence. Oh, okay, here we go. I've learned anytime anybody has to tell you how smart they are, it's probably because they're not. And if they're constantly going on and on about how, you know, they're not stupid, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. Well, maybe they are. They probably are. Uh, so you don't pay any commissions to go into a C-share. And as long as you hold them for at least one year, you don't pay any commission to get out of them. And you, you, it was so easy to tell the client, say, this is a mutual fund. It's a long-term investment anyway. Are you going to sell it in a year? That's a short-term investment, like a bank CD. Uh, you know, you're going to go on vacation next year, this time next year. You want to go to Florida. You got the money now, but you want to make sure you don't spend it. Lock it up in a one-year bank CD. It matures, you know, comes and gives you your point zero 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 times infinity, 1% interest, and then you go to Florida. Get out of this crap, right? Um, but, and I would always tell these folks this, but it has annual higher percentage fees actually like five times higher than the A shares. You know, A shares like one fourth of one percent, you know, in management fees. C shares like two and a half percent. Like, but I'm not paying you five percent right off the top and you're not taking my money. And if I need my money three years from now, I'm not paying three percent to get out. I'm too smart for that. Okay. Sell the C shares after five years. Okay, listen. That after five years longer, seven years especially, there's folks that bought those from me 20 years ago that probably still have them who have paid so many times more than the folks who bought the A shares and even the B shares. But they got to go around in their little social circles bragging about how they don't pay commissions because they're so smart. <sighs> All right. You know what this does is it costs you opportunity. And in the long term... You miss out on so much. You know, I mentioned knowing a guy that had Kruger Dunnings. Uh, this is an example, and this is an actual 
actual conversation we had once. This is when I'd first met this individual, and, and uh, this individual claimed that they did this, this, or whatever. It, it, no, he doesn't. Uh, you know, you can pay $50 a year to your county, or at least here's how it works in Admiral County, Virginia. You pay $50, and they'll give you a business license. This is one of many, many people who pays $50 a year to get that business license so they can claim they have a business, someone, whatever. No, that's not the truth. This person doesn't work. They look for ways not to have to work, and they figure out ways to have other people take care of them. Very manipulative, very sociopathic, and I truly believe it stems from Kruger Dunning. Here's why. Um, one of the first stories this person, uh, when they found out I kind of have a business background and understand business, do some business type stuff. Social media is a business, whether you like it or not. Writing, you know, I write my books and you really should buy them, especially that novel that it came out last year, The Lunatic, which you can get autographed and it is available from our Etsy store. The link's in the description box below. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it is art when I'm creating it and I view myself as an artist as I write it. But once it's finished, it's a widget for sale. And if they don't sell... My efforts were in vain because it doesn't generate revenues. Now, does that mean I write for money? No. And trust me, I spent many years going hungry while I was writing more than I ever have. But since I didn't write for money, I didn't make any. And uh, I was hungry. But uh, I've been fortunate mostly because of those of you watching who have blessed me with uh, your readership business and buy my books. And now, hmm, uh, I'm not hungry. And uh, But here's the point. The guy's like, Oh, you know, uh, this guy contacted me and he wanted me to do this. And well, I told him that's a, you know, X amount of dollars job. And I'm like, wow, man, that's a nice payday. He goes, well, it's just not going to happen. I'm like, why not? He goes, well, the guy needed it. And, you know, this time frame and it just wasn't long enough. I, I need this much time. And I'm like, well, that's not that much longer. And he goes, oh, I know, I know. But, you know, these rich people, they're just, they're crazy. And he wanted it by such and so date. And I just couldn't do it. And so I just told him he's just going to have to find someone else to do it. And I'm thinking, wow, what a letdown, man. I thought this story was going to finish with him saying, well, and since I knew the time frame was just too short, I stayed up at night and I didn't sleep. And I subcontracted people to work underneath me so we could get it done. And we got it done and I got paid. Because that's what people who are successful do. They don't, they don't make excuses as to why they can't achieve what it is they want to achieve. And I would assume if your little business license says this is your business, you probably want to be successful and produce in that line of work, right? Well, not this guy. He wants to go around just showing how smart he is, how much he knows. And um, so it was story after story of missed opportunities. And I just walked away with my head shaking saying, good gosh, man. Uh, I mean, trust me, there have been many sleepless nights when I've stayed up typing till my fingers are bleeding, figuratively, not literally, to finish a project. You know, man, it's like running a race. There's a finish line. Why are you going to stop and walk? <laughs> man, you sprint through that finish line till that tape breaks across your chest, man. Then you fall down on the infield and... You don't throw up because you're in shape. You're probably going to dry heave. Listen, when I won a state mile championship, my first step after I crossed that finish line and broke that tape was into the infield, right? I don't know how long I was out. I came to and there, put it was 96 degrees on the track. Uh, whatever. So here's my point. Listen, man, it's not about being able to say, I know more than you, or I know so much, or I'm so smart. It's about taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. <laughs> It's okay, like that college professor I had, to say, I don't know, and go find the answer. Because you know what that makes you? It makes you human. Okay, so don't worry about making it look like you know all the answers today, or you're too smart to fall for this, or too smart to fall for that, because you don't know what you might be falling for long term. I'm telling you, today's know-it-all, most likely and most times, ends up being a long-term dumbass. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Bird calls and tree knocks. See you next time for more.